Thanks everybody for coming to our session on the short story today. This is an exciting, exciting time to have this, uh, this dialogue, especially uh, right now given the energy around the short story and what uh, a lot of the writers that are in the City of London right now. Um, our host today is Russell Smith. Since 1989, he has been a freelance journalist and cultural commentator, publishing in details the New York Review of Books, the Globe and Mail, Toronto Life, Now, Flair. You guys have seen his articles. You've heard him on the CBC Radio 1 programs. Uh, his fiction is largely contemporary in setting and satirical in tone. It has been nominated for several major awards, including the Giller Prize, the Governor General's Award, the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize, the Trillium Prize, and the Chapters Books in Canada First Novel Award. Uh, we're really, really pleased and honoured to have Russell hosting this session, and he has actually a new book of Best Canadian Short Stories 2018 that's come out from Biblio Oasis, so that's something to check out as well. Yes, absolutely. So I'm going to throw things over to Russell. Thank you. So we're just going to sit and talk with these three authors about uh, what a short story is, really. Um, but to start, I thought I would ask each of them to read a short excerpt, a very short excerpt from their work. So we're going to go in order uh, as closeness to me. Uh, and we're going to start with Paige Cooper, who will read from her new book, Zolitude, right? You will be? OK. So uh, Paige Cooper was born and raised in the Rocky Mountains, and she now lives in Montreal. And this book, Zolitude, has uh, done extraordinarily well. It was long listed for the Giller Prize and shortlisted for the Governor General's Award, which it should have won. Paige. Yes. <laughs> It is so exciting to be here. Um, I'm going to read from a story called Slave Creighton. Erin wields the hatchet lightly, like it's lit upon her hand. The cedars here have been dead longer than they were alive. Most are fallen, whale spines crest in the grass. This piece of land dropped so suddenly into the ocean they suffocated all at once. Ever since, Aaron told him, the land's been rising again. She stops at a trunk that's crashed sideways to lie canted at hip height. She pushes against it, solid, decomposing firmly into the grass. She takes one experimental swing and the hatchet glances off the wood. A chip of bark wings away. Good, she grins at him, wriggles out of her backpack. Michael is still wearing his dirty yellow life preserver. She left hers with the kayaks. He's sweating badly. He takes it off and holds it. Can we uh, eat first, he says. I wouldn't, she says. You just puke. She opens the first aid kit, passes the roll of gauze to him, and wraps a wide blue elastic band four times around the base of her ring finger. He can't avoid her eyes. She touches his wrist. Ready? she says. Her gaze has that cloudless intensity that means she is thinking about how much she loves him, though she won't say it. Thank God. His gut twists, shit, or eat. His hands are cold and wet. She should know better. She should be able to see into him clearly enough to stop herself. Right hand splayed over the trunk. She swings one hard and perfect stroke with her left. Her breath releases in a high sigh. Can you wrap it? The wind in the trees is a highway roar. Blood spurts childishly. Michael, can you help me wrap it? She missed slightly, hit halfway between the top knuckle and the second. He hovers, but she pinces the end of the gauze and pushes it into the stump. The idea was just the top knuckle, the fingernail, essentially, instead of a ring, something irreversible. Easy, she hisses through her teeth, sweat pools above her lips. See, motherfuck, she says. I don't think so, he says. It feels, oh shit, it hurts, her grin comes back. Quick, she says. I can't do it for you, she says. Michael, she says. The water has a slight seaward current. It slinks at the same t speed as time. He doesn't look at her swabbed finger or her shining face. If he looks, the entire landscape will collapse and she'll rush in like the ocean to engulf him. He picks up his life preserver again. He takes a step back into the dead tangle. He pushes the kayak into the shallows. He leaves her like that. She will not mark him. 
Thank you. David Hubert is next. He's won the CBC Short Story Prize, the Sheldon Curry Fiction Prize, the Walrus Poetry Prize, uh, and even others. And uh, his debut short fiction collection, Peninsula Sinking, was published by Biblioasis in fall of 2017. And he also is the author of the poetry collection, We Are No Longer the Smart Kids in Class. And he also has a story in this new anthology I edited called Best Canadian Stories 2018. David. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to my basement. <laughs> <laughs> I like the uh, I like the fact that the uh, the room here is inspired by Wayne's World. <laughs> this is one of my favorite films growing up, so it's always um, it's always a pleasure. Um, I'm going to read from one called Horse People. Uh, I got really interested in the phrase Horse People. Any Horse People in the room? Horse People? Okay, yeah. So. Um, it's a weird, weird phrase. We just, we call people horse people because they're affiliated with horses, but we don't really necessarily think about Gulliver's travels all the time. Um, okay, the thing that you need to know maybe is that uh, the first person narrator is a woman, a young woman, youngish woman, horse people. The manager of jumping calls and asks me to wiggle his mouse around, which at first I think is sexual. But then he says, seriously, there's an emergency at home and he wants me to go into his office every 15, 20 to jiggle the mouse around, maybe tap a few keys. <laughs> there are monitors, he says. Denise gets alerts. I know this is weird, but if you want my recommendation for that position in dressage. I'm not sure I want his recommendation, but I write down his door code, 0000, <laughs> and computer password, horse dude and walk into the office with the pictures of his hairdresser wife and pageant prim daughters grinning together, their mouths full of cantaloupe. I sit cruising his mouse around, its pad, and then I'm logging in. I think about searching the hard drive or the browser history, but decide I don't want to find anything dark and still have to smile as I stare into his Belmont brown teeth. I'm drifting the cursor around a pixelated beachscape a confetti of desktop icons amid tiki huts and plastic cups when Denise raps on the glass. It is presumably less than ideal to have the CEO knocking on the big open window that looks onto a carpeted hallway, the window with blinds that I did not think to close. It's not great to have the CEO observe me illegally shifting office habitats to undertake phony computer activity, and then Denise walks right in. He asked you to come in and move his mouse around. <laughs> I nod into Denise's tectonic jaw. Pinky dick shithole. I must look stunned because she says, off the record but true, he's a scandalous man whore. <laughs> the manager of jumping, she explains, has been liaising with the breeder from Barbados who was in for a presentation yesterday, the one with the upturned nose. Denise tells me, just between us girls, that the breeder is also a married woman. Then she tells me to get back to my cubicle pulling out her phone to call the manager of jumping. I head to my desk and sit checking horse passports and listening to the squirrel rocking around the ceiling, the ceiling panels. The manager of jumping calls toilet paper shit tickets. The manager of jumping's favorite casual Friday t-shirt says, I support the performing arts next to a swervy cartoon butt in a sequin G-string. The manager of jumping is actually named Chad, but I prefer to think of him as the manager of jumping because when I told Pierce his job title, there was some confusion and then various <laughs> running jokes about the superintendent of leaping, the director de saute. The manager of jumping pronounces minestrone, mine strone. The manager of jumping uses gay as a pejorative. Once Denise asked if he was a homophobe and he went pale before blurting, no I'm not, you're the friggin' homo. <laughs> The manager of jumping has almost no lips and one of those beardless male faces with marble cake swirls of blush as if he were constantly exercising. 
The manager of jumping is generally disliked in the office, but the manager of jumping has been here 27 years. The manager of jumping had not yet learned my name when he walked into my cubicle and without pretense asked about my left ear. How'd you get that prune ear? Which, what if I'd been born like this? What if it was a birth defect? What if I'd emerged from the womb with an extra pinky or a huge birthmark? I suspect that in each case, the manager of jumping would have walked directly over and asked me to account for my abnormalities. Thanks. Aaron Kreuter writes both fiction and poetry. So his 2016 poetry collection, Arguments for Lawn Chairs, was published by Guernica. And the short story collection, You and Me Belonging, will come out from Tytro Books in this fall. Is it out already? It's out, okay. And he's currently pursuing a PhD at York University where he also teaches Aaron. Thanks, Russell, and uh, thanks for coming. I'll, uh, I'll skip my Wayne's World joke. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to read the first uh, couple pages from the story in my collection called Searching for Crude. <clears throat> Searching for Crude. Ricky Rosenfeld didn't want an affair. He didn't want a divorce. He didn't want a car fancier or more expensive than the six he already owned. He was already exceedingly successful, already exceedingly wealthy, with a house in the valley and a cottage with 300 feet of untrammeled shoreline on the second most prestigious lake in Muskoka. So what was it then that Ricky Rosenfeld wanted? What was it that had so completely consumed him that he was willing to blow it all on? It was simple. He wanted to be able to pick up a guitar and play howling music, to perform magic, change lives, meld hearts to not only master the instrument, but for it to master him. And it was all because of Crude. Ricky first experienced Crude Franzen during the cocktail hour of his nephew's wedding. He stood at the bar, Trudy beside him, talking tennis with his brother and sister-in-law, his two children off with their cousins, and watched the trio of two guitars and a double bass play gypsy jazz in the corner, ill-fitting pink kippahs plopped on their heads. The rhythm guitarist and the bassist were obviously both accomplished musicians, but it was crude that had Ricky mesmerized. Every note sung right through the bullshit and remained humming in Ricky's chest long after crude's fingers moved on. It was a barrage of tremendous melodies and three-note rushes of chordal harmony, crude's emotive face smiling throughout. Ricky was entranced. His children, brothers, family, friends, business contacts, even the wedding day radiance of his nephew's new wife, everything was forgotten. For the first time in his life, Ricky felt unsatisfied with what he had accomplished, what he had made of himself. What did any of it matter in the face of such torrential beauty? After the doors to the banquet hall had opened, and as the musicians were packing up their gear, Ricky went up to speak to Crude. Ricky had regular business dealings with the most powerful people in Toronto, had a standing lunch date with the fourth richest man in Taiwan whenever he was in the country. But approaching Crude, lazily coiling his patch cords, the pink kippa sitting like a puffball on his head, Ricky is as, was as nervous as a hormonal teenager. Hi, uh, I just wanted to say, I really liked your stuff, he said. It was very eye-opening. Crude looked up, his eyes downright twinkled. Why, thank you, kind sir, he said. Ricky stood there. He had to say something else. Do you, uh, do you have a business card? Crude laughed. No boss, no card. The name's Crude, though. He stuck out his hand, and Ricky shook it. It was rough, calloused, warm. Oh, well, here, take mine, Ricky said, reaching into his suit pocket and handing Crude his card. Ricky Rosenfeld, CEO, funding partner. He'd always been proud of the graphic from Asada Assets and Investing, the unscalable heft of the chunky block letters. But as Crude took it from him, he became unsure, thought it looked cheap, disposable. Crude took the small piece of cardstock like it was a custom unknown to him, let it drop into his open guitar case. He stared at Ricky, waiting for him to say something so he could get back to packing up. Ricky was trying to decide if he should lavish this man with praise or just keep it cool, swinging wildly between the two alternatives. An impasse. 
Yeah, Crude said eventually, drawing the word out. Hey, I'm playing this Tuesday night at the Socialist Cousin downtown, if you want to check it out. Ricky blinked. Oh, yeah, great. He started nodding profusely, as if he were making a long series of decisions. The Socialist Cousin got it. They shook hands, and Ricky went to find his wife in the banquet hall. When he came out again an hour later, unable to focus on his brother's speech, which was droning on and on, tired of the scowl his son, Jonah, hadn't failed all night to exhibit when looking Ricky's way, Crude and his bandmates were gone. Two chairs and a glass with half-melted ice and a chewed white straw, the only things left from their performance. Thanks. Thank you. Great readings. Are these on? I no? think so. How about now? Now. Now. I might have had a mic drop. Did we have a mic drop? Now. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to start with a very obvious question about what a short story is that every. Um, Every creative writing course I've ever taught, we have to have this conversation about the difference between a short story and a novel, right? Um, <clears throat> but let me, let, and I want someone by the end of this conversation to have come up with some kind of definition of a short story <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, for me. Let me maybe go at it a, 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 a kind of an oblique way. Um, all of you write uh, different forms of things. Um, David and Aaron, you both write poetry. Have you published poetry, Paige? No. Uh, you write essays uh, as well as fiction. But nobody here has published a novel. Is it a conscious choice, or are you working on a novel? <laughs> David, you start. <laughs> I, uh, I, 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 should I say N-word? I call it the N-word. <laughs> I refuse to, uh, I refuse to, uh, disclose whether or not I'm working on a novel. But I am. Yeah, it's top, it's top secret. Yeah. And why does, one, why does one say that sheepishly? And you're not alone. I mean, what? Yeah, because I think... Uh, Does it work? Yeah. Because um, uh, the process of writing a novel can devour you. And it can, uh, it can appear to be much closer at different times than it actually is. And it can... Yeah, it can become a void of itself, and yeah. But okay, but so that that leads to the obvious question then: Why? What? Did, why do you not feel that about a short story? Is it just a question of length? And I open it to you guys as well. Well, Aaron told me beforehand that he was going to speak very little <laughs> during this panel. That's, that's one of his plans, so we'll see how that unfolds. I always say I'm going to speak very little so I can feel worse when I speak a lot. <laughs> um, I, I mean, obviously, the length is one of the major differences between a short story and a novel, but I don't think it's the, the only difference. But uh, whenever I'm asked to define a short story, whether it's in a, in a classroom or, or just in a conversation, uh, I always go back to, to Poe's definition, which I think is, is pretty good. And Poe said a, a short story is a piece of fiction that you can read in one sitting. And uh, I like that because it speaks about the length of, of, of reading and not necessarily how long it is. But I also like that definition because it's very capacious. It's big enough to hold many different types of uh, uh, short fiction. But Poe's stories are very different from the story post-modernism, and I don't mean post-modernist story, I mean after modernism. Um, we're all basically writing modernist short stories, I think. We're not writing those anecdotal Maupassant stories that end with a twist or a revelation um, uh, that are based in plot. How does plot influence your short story? My uh, definition for a short story was going to be something where you can hold the shape of it, not necessarily in your hand, but in your mind at one time. And I think that's why a novel gets into voidish mind territory, is because it's, it's too shifting and it's too large. Um, the last time I tried to work on my novel, I'd forgotten my, the main character's name. So I was like, hmm, what else have I forgotten about this 
great idea. Uh, but so plot, yeah. I mean, do you have to think more about plot in a novel? Depending on the kind of novel you write, I mean, I think a lot more about information with a novel and like what kind of, which is uh, information can drive plot, I guess. So as opposed to the uh, a short story where I'm thinking about like uh, the information the reader has or the information the character has in the novel, suddenly I'm worried about the information I have when I don't have and I start to feel very ignorant. <laughs> um, Wait, just for the non-writers, what do you mean by information? You mean, you mean, I mean, I'm information about the characters and what's going on? Like all of the, uh, everything that goes into situating ourselves. Um, uh, and it can be as simple as like, is the sky blue in this story? And it can be a lot more along the lines of like, uh, spy, thriller, twists and turns. Your short stories can be very disorienting to a reader in that it does take us a moment, or a few pages anyway, to figure out where we are and what's going on and who is related to whom. A, is that deliberate, and B, do you think you do it differently in a novel? Yeah, I worry. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I would probably... Hmm. I don't know so that I can do it differently. Is part of the joy of reading your story that sudden immersion in mystery? Did... It, well, that's the joy of it for me. So if I was going to do it differently, it would, be, it would be a very different writing process. Like, I don't know how you guys do it, but it, it's kind of like this um, magpie situation where you're just grabbing all of these weird little details and then accumulating them and then I usually have to get like a second reader or someone to go through and be like, I need this basic question answered before you can get on with anything else. Um, yeah, I, I think honestly, it would be really difficult to write any other way. Mm -hmm. but it's probably good to try, like this is why we have to try different forms. How much do you guys disorient your reader at the beginning of every story? Yeah, uh, I think it's a great question, and, and you're absolutely right about pages work, and that is what makes pages work totally compelling. And uh, I, do it, I do it a fair amount, too, probably not quite as much, but I do like to not give away, I do like to withhold information, and I do like to disorient the reader. I think withholding information is very, very important to help with plotting. Um, I think, um, I think the novel, I think, so this is it, we're getting towards an interesting definition of the short story because I don't think that the novel can dis sustain disorientation to the same extent, or in other words, the novel can't repeatedly replicate the thrill of disorientation that you get in each new story and pages collection, right, mm -hmm. when you come across it. So how do you, so you might have a hook there in your novel, but by 20 pages in, uh, it's over. Yeah. And so, where's the next trick in your, you know, uh, arsenal? Uh, I think D Dave mentioning, uh, uh, you know, you read one story and then uh, that sort of the hook is, it, it, it completes itself and then you go on to the next story that also gets to something about what a short story is and can do that a novel can't, right? That a short story can be co collected in, in, a, in a collection is very much listening to a very well put together uh, rock album, right? Where you listen to the songs and they have a real cumulative effect. Um, you know, uh, back to the question of why why am I why I publish short fiction and haven't written or published a novel? Um, I mean, short fiction is my first love for sure. I just I love the form and I love I love what it can do. And I don't think I think the ability for a short story to 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 excite you and to to rock your world and to defamiliarize you and to like make you think change is possible or whatever it is. It doesn't have to do any of those things, but it can do all of them also. I think it's, uh, it's amazing. And I think the short story collection in particular, when you have a number of stories doing that, it, coming at it from different ways, it can really uh, have that cumulative effect. Mm. Are your stories in your collection linked by theme, by subject or setting? Um, in this collection, uh, maybe broadly by theme, but not, not too per particularly. But there are things that, that occur over the, over the majority of stories. Oh, okay. But what you're all saying about this, what we're calling somewhat vaguely disorientation, which it's hard to explain if you haven't read all these authors' work, but there is um, 
in not just their work, but in, in most contemporary short stories, often a sense of mystery that takes a few pages to absorb. That's quite different from Poe. I'm glad you mentioned Poe, the early short story, where there's exposition right from the beginning to tell you what the relationships are. Um, you know, the thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne without complaint, but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. <laughs> um, that's the setup. We have it right away. Whereas that is going to, in Page's story, is going to be buried. It would take quite a while uh, to come out. Um, what is it about, about the contemporary moment that requires that in the story? Think about I don't know if I, I don't know if I could answer that question. Yeah. Uh, what about the contemporary moment? Well, um, but I did want to. I just wanted to say in response to what, in response to the Poe versus après modernism, not postmodernism question. Um, uh, Poe's stories, I think, are based in a raconteur mode as well. And I've been thinking about orality and the question of oral storytelling and the short story. Um, I think that the length of the short story very much comes also out of a, a conventional generic idea of a story we could tell in a single sitting also, right? But the modernist post, uh, short story, as a lot of us are doing it, is much more lyrical and much more, I think, inspired by collage um, art forms. So sort of those post-World War I modernist collage art forms, I think the way that I think it has. I think that partly has to do with the fragmented experience of contemporary life. Does the word collage speak to you, Paige? Oh, for sure. I like I, magpie and collage. Absolutely. That's definitely that like period of openness that you go through when you're collecting for a first draft, especially. But yeah, you're right. The the way in which we process the world kind of makes us impatient in terms of just like sitting quietly and listening to one voice because we all have critical thinking abilities. We're all going like, we're all gonna like cycle through that pretty fast. And so the stories have to do more. They have to have more sensory information even though they're still just like black marks on a page. Like um, they have to come at things from multiple angles and that mystery is, uh, Hopefully compelling. I mean, we all have to have enough ambition to keep people interested in reading, and that's that's the hard part, is keeping a story ambitious. I just wanted to add that uh, I don't necessarily think that the short story today needs to just drop the reader into a, a fictional world like that. Um, the story I happen to read really does what, exactly what you were just saying. It sort of sets up the major themes, and then uh, goes beyond that, but it, it does have that sort of introduction that not all short stories do. I mean, I have other, another story in, in the collection, you know, starts in 1911, but it really ends up taking place in contemporary time. So I, I think, uh, you know, short stories don't have to start one way. They can start in a multitude of ways, which is what one thing that draws me to the form for, for sure. I want to get back to the idea of story in the story. And we, I want to try to get to a, a definition, which is so hard, especially when you're teaching short stories about what, a, what actually constitutes a story on a beginning and a middle and an end. It has been argued that the contemporary short story is closer to poetry than it is to the novel. What do you think of that? You're, I mean, you, you all write quite poetic fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to argue with that. I feel like uh, short story readers are, the ones I've met, are definitely likely to be reading a lot of poetry um, versus novels. I certainly read a lot, or have read in the past, more poetry than novels, with the exception of like my terrible history of reading a lot of genre novels, uh, which we will not get into. Oh, yeah. But, <laughs> um, yeah, no, it, it, with the exception of narrative, it's, uh, it's just, it can be this, a short story can just be like a feeling. It does, maybe it doesn't have as many formal constraints as poetry, but uh, it's doing, it's creating an emotion in you, which is what a poem should do. And it's like one emotion, hopefully. Well, it, it might be more, but often it's just one solid. 
miasma. Okay, so is that all it needs to do, create a feeling, or does something have to happen in terms of event? David? Uh, yeah, I think something has, I think for me as a reader, I prefer stories in which something happens. <laughs> uh, I got a great compliment from a fellow writer who read my collection and was like, yeah, your stories, uh, they're great, and uh, I really like them because things happen in them. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So what, de what defines that? What, what defines a thing happening? <laughs> Give me an example of a thing happening. Oh, yeah, like, um, usually something terrible happens. <laughs> something unexpected. Um, you know, I like to create movement in my stories. You know, when I do teach uh, creative writing, I would tell somebody like, when you're, if you're stuck in a moment, just like make something move in the story. Like make, smash this water glass against the wall and see what happens and see how characters respond to that. And so, yeah. Uh, and making, uh, setting up surprise for the reader. Uh, D David Bezmosk is the author of the short story collection, Natasha, uh, likes to say that, uh, uh, characters in a short story ha have to leave their room or leave their head. They have to like go out into the world, <laughs> which I think is a, which is something that uh, like if you're teaching creative writing, something that uh, like first year sh short story writers need need to hear. Mm. So that, that I, I agree. Question. Yeah, and you'd be surprised how often that needs to be right. Exactly. Plain. Yeah. <laughs> I often say that a, uh, the, my only definition of story is a change. It, a change has to occur either for the character. The character has to start in place A emotionally and end in place B, or the reader could see everything in a different light by the end of it, but the change could be the character or the reader, but we have to have made some emotional change from that. We can't end, start in place A and end in place A. Would you agree? Uh, Michael Shaben called it the contemporary revelatory moment of truth short story that like he defined the genre. And like that makes, I don't know that I would necessarily consciously think about um, the epiphany. I know that we were taught the epiphany <laughs> as the structure of the short story and that the character must have the opportunity to change or not change. But I don't think I've um, consciously built that in ever. Do you guys? Is any of this conscious? No, none of it is conscious, except for the copy editing. <laughs> that you need to do very awake. Are you a conscious writer? You guys, are you, you, are you in a trance? Well, there, there's definitely an element of consciousness to it, but there's also an element of, of trance. <laughs> uh, every story, every, every story, every poem, you know, has its own process, right? And you have to sort of find that process. There's definitely the part where it's more, the, the, the sentences are just sort of coming out and then there's more where you have to step back and be like, okay, what are these sentences doing? I have to figure, or I have to figure out this problem that's gonna happen, that, that, that I'm confronting in the text and, uh, and then you can slip back into trance. So I, I don't really think there's an easy either or for that question, at least how I write. Uh, yeah, trance. I think the story seduces you. I think if the story is seducing you and compelling you, and there's a propulsiveness to it when you're writing. And I think that's one of the things that's exciting about writing short stories. With each new one, you kind of get that thrill quickly, and you don't need to have that. Uh, I mean, it might still take you a long, a relatively long time to complete a short story, but um, you can see the end of it, and you can see, you can feel the pull of it. Yeah. And so uh, I don't. So no, I've never self-consciously thought about epiphanies, but um, yeah. What's What's your favorite last line or moment, closing moment in the story? Not from one of yours, but, but, but from anyone's. What's the best way to end a short story? That's two different questions. <laughs> That's two different questions. <laughs> okay, well, what's, give me a favorite ending line or, or scene or moment. Yeah. Uh, I read a short story once where the and line was so good I moved to Latvia for it. <laughs> it was it was in like one of the best American compilations. It was Salvatore Scabona, who ended up being like a modernist novelist and I don't think he ever published a book of short stories or hasn't yet. But it was a book about um, or sorry, it was a short story about a sheep farmer in Iceland. 
but it was written in Latvia on like a writing residency or something. Anyway, so it goes through and the last, it's, it's all in the third person. It's like a distant third. And at the very end, um, there's a sudden appearance of a much yearned for figure and the uh, line changes to second person. And it's just like one instance of second person in the whole story. And it was so shocking. And that I was like, well, if he can write that in Latvia, I better move to Latvia. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have examples? Uh, yeah, I guess two, two examples can't come to mind. And I, uh, just thinking about it now, I think they both sort of end on a strong, like, shocking image that sort of, like, goes back and changes the, the story. Uh, which isn't necessarily how I think all stories should end, per se. But the first is uh, Dennis Johnston's short story work from his... Uh, excellent collection, Jesus' the Son, which I return to often. Uh, the story is about these two sort of down and out characters who uh, go to this area of the suburbs that have been hit by a flood and all the houses are abandoned and they're going and they're, they're taking all the copper from the walls to sell and they make enough money to like go to the bar and, and get uh, start drinking basically. And it ends with this sort of uh, pee in to uh, the, this bartender uh, who, who's like, uh, the image is of her pouring the, the shots right up to the lip and they're going down to them like hummingbirds. And it's this really powerful image of like supplication. Uh, yeah. And, <laughs> um, and, and the other one is from a Mavis Galan story. I don't remember the title, but it takes place in Europe in the, in the 30s. And it's about this community of like uh, diverse uh, European people, as a, a lot of Galant, Galant stories are, and uh, there's a there's a Jewish character, and at the very end of the story, the narrator just happens to see the Jewish character being taken away by the Nazis, and it sort of just like shatters the entire fictional world of the of the story, and he realizes the historical forces that are swirling around outside of it. Yeah, I, are you going to ask beginnings after? Okay, sure. <laughs> no, because I just don't want to give away my beginnings. Beginnings are though. easy. Are they? Yeah. Okay. Endings are hard. Okay. Uh, okay. So I'll tell you my beginning, <laughs> which is uh, from a George Saunders story called Sea Oak. And he says, at Sea Oak, there was no sea and no oak. <laughs> um, yeah. And, uh, but it, sea Oak also has an amazing middle. <laughs> yes, exactly. And that's what I'm going to talk about, too. Um, because well, uh, this is also top secret, but usually when I'm like looking for an ending, I just read some George Saunders. and. <laughs> basically lift what he does um, in my own voice, very, very specifically. Um, yeah, but uh, so Sea Oak also has this kind of ghost figure come back. It appears to be a realist, well, not exactly realist, but very strange, weird, uh, near future suburbia situation. And then suddenly a ghost enters the story and is taken very, very seriously as ghost and is but it's, uh, and the corpse is decomposing in a very, very visceral way. Um, and just that sudden left turn in the story helped me rethink about um, how to twist, how to create a swerve productively in the story. They're turning that story into a TV show, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, there's, there's hope for all of us then. Uh, um, I mean, that draws, brings me to the commercial... Especially George Saunders, though. Yeah. <laughs> that brings me to the commercial question. I mean, I think we're the, 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 this, this short story is, is a delightful uh, and thrilling form for all the reasons we've been discussing, and one would think that it would be extremely popular in an age of the shortened attention span, and that we all know that the opposite is true. Publishers hate... Uh, us to come to them and say, oh, I've got a short story collection. They roll their eyes and put their heads down on the desk because nobody wants to buy short story collections. Um, and the big presses hardly publish them at all anymore um, unless the writer's already well known for writing novels. And if they do take a short story collection from you, they say, well, take it on the condition you provide a novel next because uh, we all know that people um, buy novels more. Why is this? Why, uh, why don't people like Short stories, even avid readers say the short story is too difficult for me. It has this reputation as being the artsy form and, and somewhat obscure. Which might be another reason why it's close to poetry, at least mm. in the public imagination. Mm. Mm. Well, that ties into what I was thinking, which is like, if you're a poet, 
first. <laughs> then you think, oh, a short fiction is extremely marketable. You're selling out. It's so <laughs> lucrative. And, uh, and actually, you've got all your relatives coming out of the woodwork and being like, hey, I read your book. And you're like, what? It's amazing. You never like, even sniffed my poetry book. <laughs> you're a glass half full guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I just, yeah, you're entirely right. It is a lot of work, and it's a lot to ask someone to invest in, like, creating something with you, like the reader and the writer working together, um, if it's only going to last, like, 20 minutes. It's not, I mean, what I find interesting is the rise of the uh, essay, the personal essay. That is extremely consumable for most people so you know maybe we should all just be writing like auto fictional monologues for the internet and then people would read them but I like I you value anyone who takes who's willing to do that with you and who's willing to do that work and maybe that's a very specific kind of brain that takes satisfaction in it but um, was there ever a golden age where everyone was reading short stories? Mm. Well, when they were, when there was an age when they were published in commercial magazines, which and even in Canada that was quite recent. And no, no, they're all, the Walrus, the Walrus is is you know publishes a short story every now and then, but that's about it. Um, and so we're we're out of it. Um, it's it's time to wrap up and ask questions um, of the audience. I just wanted to end um, by talking about theme for a minute and, and your subject matter. Um, uh, I, first of all, I just wanted to address that question about the personal essay because one of the things I argue in my introduction to Best Canadian Stories, the great joy of fiction is that it is not making an argument. It is not didactic and it is not asking you to take a position. Um, and, um, and we should maintain that distinction between the fictional and, and the polemic. Uh, uh, I think it's a whole different pleasure uh, to it. So I'm grateful for you guys for writing, explicitly writing fictional <laughs> stories. So how do you come up with those stories and how are they different from you? Um, I know you, David, you really explore a very wide variety of characters, in, in particularly in different jobs. You do actual research on, uh, on these jobs. Um, and they're not, all, they're not all you. I mean, all of you write stories that are not autobiographical. Um, they're extremely imaginative um, and um, uh, so how do you come up with where does the idea for each story come from? Is it primarily anecdote? That's where a lot of mine come from, anecdote. Funny thing happened to a friend. Uh, second could be um, character, amusing character or, or quirky character. Uh, the third for me is simply setting. I just remember a feeling in a bar one night. Um, uh, what is it for you? Where do the ideas come from? Especially, especially when they're so foreign to you. Well, I'm glad you asked that, Russell. <laughs> um, because uh, yesterday I was talking about, uh, I saw David Adams Richards read recently, and he said, um, uh, every character you ever write is you. And that's 100%. He said, uh, and that's absolutely true. <laughs> and I totally bought it. I was like, yes, that's absolutely true. Because um, you can't not write yourself. So the flip side of that is I did start, uh, when I was first experimenting with writing fiction, with writing versions of my own shitty, boring life. Um, and I got, uh, I was hitting walls. And I realized that the more I pushed myself to write some an, an, an other experience, the more I push myself to try to imagine a different way uh, of being. Um, and hopefully something that I still had some sort of intimate knowledge of somehow or could get that, uh, the better my writing got. So, yeah. Um, that doesn't, yeah. yeah. What is, let me ask you, what, what is the most foreign character to yourself that you've ever written? Let's see. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that's a hard question for me to think about on the spot, I guess. But I've written from the point of view of 
uh, a Palestinian woman, which I guess is quite far from me as a Jewish man. <laughs> but so that'll be my answer. I didn't. So let me just uh, clarify. I didn't. As David says, is it still you? Definitely. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. Uh, and I, when I said I write, from, I wrote from the perspective. The story wasn't from that character's perspective. They were just a character in the story. I wanted to clarify that. Yeah. Um. A war vet from Vietnam living with his girlfriend in, I guess, Phnom Penh or near uh, Ho Chi Minh City um, would be the farthest from me. But I would say I often start with landscape or, like David, jobs. Like, I'm big into self-insertion fantasies. Like, I just really wish I was a crane operator on, like, a construction site because I think that would be the coolest. But, uh, and because you can't do all of the jobs, you then have to go and write about it instead. Um, and then the jobs that have the more interesting terminology and the jargon and that whole uh, language aspect are the most exciting to write about. Do you do research, journalistic research? Yes, but I try to limit it because you can go way too far down that rabbit hole. <laughs> and but also that might be a short fiction novel distinction as well. There's a there's a real uh, uh, similarity in Paige and Dave's short stories. I think in, in just the vast diversity of of, of settings and character types and uh, uh, situ and situations. Yeah, I definitely noticed that. Again, that's a, that's a huge fundamental difference from the personal essay uh, there, that imaginative stretch and the research and the taking on the language and vocabulary of a character you've researched who does it. Why, are we, why is it uh, that Canadian fiction in particular seems so averse to describing people in power, powerful people? Is that true? And if so, why? Uh, do we have uh, as flashy, powerful people as the Americans? I think we're. I think we think about America a lot. Um, I know I do, and so my criticisms, uh, like my criticisms for Canada, feel sometimes a little minute compared to my criticisms for the rest of the world. Uh, and that's not to say I'm a huge nationalist at, by any means, but um, uh, it's, it's not as flashy. And I'm drawn to shiny things. So, so what you're saying, Russell, is that the four of us should edit an anthology of short fiction on about Canadian senators? <laughs> You know, I just read 200 short stories published in the last year and a half, and it's it's uh, it's true that there uh, that the small town and the lousy job are far overrepresented still, um, whereas the Canada I know is made up of lawyers and literary agents and TV producers and. Um, and people who work in artificial intelligence, or you know, they they have really interesting jobs, and many of them have power. Um, you know, many of them are, might actually run a company rather than working in Walmart. Um, and that is still extremely underrepresented. If you were a Martian, you came to Canada, uh, and you read, you thought, I don't. If you never come to Canada, and you think I'm going to learn about this country solely from its short stories, you would think it's a country with no cities in it, uh, and, a, and, a, and a country where where. Nobody uh, has any interesting job, and never an argument about the Middle East, or never an argument about Bitcoin, and also nobody's ever met anybody who's ever told a joke, and <laughs> and and and, uh, and, uh, and there's and there's no hip hop club, and there's no fetish party, right? There's no, those those things don't uh, don't really exist. So, but I think that it's not just the urban that I'm sensing is lacking, but the urban exists in all your work. Uh, but 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 it's. The sense that we're averse to, the only way I can phrase it is people with power, people who can make influential decisions. It's an, it's an interesting uh, thing to think about for sure. If, uh, if, it, if it seems like there's no arguments, if there's no, if, if the Middle East isn't represented in Canadian fiction, then uh, that Martian is definitely not reading my book. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I wonder how much that is what people are writing as it is also what, what the journals are publishing. Uh, so like, that's a big part of it as well, right? The, what, what gets into the journals, which you, you read for the anthology and uh, yeah. Yeah, my knee-jerk response is just to say like power makes is a bit uh, like dirty. <laughs> and uh, well, I guess the thing is, um, I'm tempted generally to write like this sounds terrible saying it, but like uh, it's the underdog story, right? It's like the downtrodden. There tends to be much more of a narrative, a compelling narrative underlying the downtrodden person, and so. Uh, I'm now thinking, your question has made me think that, wow, this would be actually a kind of brilliant challenge to try to write uh, a lawyer and make it interesting, right? But, um, no offense, like, I just mean like to, to write a bureaucrat and like we have, you know, we've seen great bureaucrat fiction. Um, yeah. All right, uh, do we have some moments for questions now? Okay, um, sh shall we, uh, do you think we need the microphone to hand to people? Yeah. And then you guys can share, group share, and share. Okay. There we go. Perfect. There's one in the front here, Josh. Mics to the room, right? Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of uh, short stories that were translated and to, brought to the screen, like James Joyce's *The Dead*, and uh, I think it was Annie Proust's *The Bear That Walked Over the Mountain* or *Came Over the Mountain*. I'm wondering, would you like your short story to be translated? And would it work well? Into film. Into film. Yeah. yeah. Is she from Hollywood? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is not something I've thought about, but uh, obviously the answer was always a knee-jerk yes. Like whenever, as short fiction writers, we get anything like, oh, we would like to translate your book into French. We would like you to have an audio book. It's like the most exciting thing because it means there is a further audience. Also, uh, People like visuals. I like visuals. It's like it's an entirely different art form that um, could go horribly, obviously, because it's also art by committee. Whereas we get full control over everything over here, or at least we like to pretend we do. Um, so it would be a risk, but I think the answer is almost always yes. Aaron and I have actually had this conversation before. Uh, I don't know if you remember it, but uh, Aaron's actually said to me um, that a short story often makes a better film version than a novel. Because a novel also, I agree. yeah, mm -hmm. a novel often has way too much material, and so you're cutting, 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 and then you're cutting out um, a lot of the, what's going to be the best, a lot of people's favorite parts. Um, a short story, you might need to expand it a little bit, but if you've got a longer short story with a fair amount of dialogue, you're pretty much there. Um, yeah. I have an anecdote. I was at a party in Toronto after my first book of, after my first book of short stories came out, and I was with a, a film director, a young film, hotshot film director, and he said, "What you up to?" I said, "Well, I just had this book of short stories come out," and he said, "Cool, cool. Is there anything happening with it?" And I realized what he meant was, "Has anyone optioned it for film?" And it didn't actually exist on its own for him uh, outside of that but that it was a blueprint for a screenplay that's that's all it was and i said well yeah, yeah it's it's one of the stories won a big the national magazine award for fiction and it's been shortlisted for the toronto book award but that's not what he meant by is anything happening whether he meant he meant has anyone else bought the rights uh and i think a great deal of people think of 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 fiction as simply a stepping stone to a movie you know i know people outside the literary world the first thing they'll ask if you say I published a book is, well, is it going to be made into a film? And you say, no. And they say, don't worry, it might, you know, something might happen. It <laughs> but I'm now thinking I'd love to see a short story collection, like an iconic one, made into like a six part HBO series. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's happening with uh, Her Body and Other Parties by uh, Carmen Machado. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, just to go off that, I think uh, 
uh, I read an article about how the the anthology series of uh, like uh, like like Black Mirror, where every episode is a totally different. It's sort of like a short story collection. I think uh, those are actually making a comeback. The Twilight Zone's coming back, and uh, it could be really interesting. Uh, that book I mentioned, Her Body and Other Parties, it's also sort of sci-fi horror, so uh, uh, a short story is going to be very interestingly adapted to that format, which is now coming back. And with Netflix, you know, you can get it all at once. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Right there in the middle. Yeah. I probably don't need the mic. Well, it's really okay. Do you feel that storytelling can be taught? Or is it an innate thing? Like you can learn the structure, but can the flair for storytelling be taught in your opinion? I don't know. I think, uh, I think that's an excellent question. And I think um, it can be taught, but not necessarily by creative writing instructors. Um, it's not necessarily the best way, actually, in my opinion. I mean, there's a lot. There's a long way that creative writing instructors can get people, um, but I think one of the first, what your question made me think of was the storytelling that happened in my family when I was a kid, because I've been thinking a lot about oral traditions and um, how, uh, how the storytelling culture in my family uh, was my own oral tradition and how important that was to me. And so the way that I was taught storytelling, I think, was in that situation. I, I, are you going to confess, confess that your dad, dad was an English prof? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My dad's an English prof, and he's also a raconteur, and he also comes from a tradition of biblical, uh, a Mennonite tradition of biblical story sharing, and I think the Bible's in interesting ways actually a very oral um, text, too. Yeah. Ron Hubert, my dad, great man. My mom's also a professor, yes, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Guess what my dad did? He was a colleague of David's dad. <laughs> my dad was a truck driver. Uh, he doesn't know anyone here. Um, I f okay, probably, yes. I don't teach. Most of you have taught. Creative writing. Yes, when I was like 17, and I was unteachable. Um, <laughs> I, would, I was. I yesterday I looked at what I was writing in 2002, and I was like, this is really no. I thought I was going to read it to be cute at a little thing last night, and I was like, no, this is not happening. No one needs to know about all of this deviance that was going on in my life. Um, I feel like there are personality traits that are maybe really helpful, like noticing and um, listening and receptivity. And uh, like maybe a therapist can help certain people with those. Uh, and that maybe that's the answer. But uh, as far as classes go, I mean, what, what do we learn there? We learn to read and what to read and how to pay attention, so it comes from the rest of the world. So, no one knows. I, I, I teach creative writing, and so I have to be optimistic about it. I, 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 uh, I, and I, I, I have seen dramatic changes in students over the course of a course, and I think that um, um, what's extremely helpful is seeing how, what part of what you've written other people understand and what completely mystifies them. And I'm sure we've all benefited from Give, having our work read before it goes out for that reason. People say, I actually don't understand what happened in the end here. That's very useful. Um, but I also think that it's pe people can learn what a story is in, in, in terms of just a narrative. And what I'm talking about there is what I mean by that change. The change that happens, I, I've seen students often really change writing little, a, little, a feeling, uh, a scene, and learning how to develop that into a scene with a development, with movement, with, where, where something has changed by the end. So yes, I definitely think that's teachable. But also, as Paige mentioned, observation, 
you can you can teach people how to observe, how to keep a notebook, how to notice quirky and interesting textual details around that might serve as color for a short story. I definitely think all that can be taught. Aaron, you teach as well. What do you? I don't teach creative writing. No. Have, Have you, you taken creative writing? Of course. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Sorry, there was a mic there, yeah. I'm just curious in follow-up to the discussion or mention that some of you have parents who are professors, how, and some of you don't, how does your class background, in other words, whether you were raised working class, middle class, upper class, affect both the content and the viewpoints that you're willing to examine in your work? I feel like um, it affected a lot uh, what I was reading. So I still have this um, uh, imposter syndrome when it comes to talking to people who have grown up around books. Like V.C. Andrews was definitely on my mother's shelf. Um, it was formative. But as far, yeah, uh, when it comes to class, that like being in that generation that is like the first generation to go to university means that you are now kind of in the hybrid and you know my parents are like very proud but they're like we don't understand we my dad's like i had to check my reading comprehension i i didn't know if i understood any of that and i was like it's okay no no it's fine um so you end up kind of in this in-between state which is again useful for observing because you're not like you're not fitting in neatly in either way um the more alienated you can stay as a writer the more helpful it is but it's not nice <laughs> so it's, you can also relax i think it's helpful uh i think it's a brilliant question and i need to do some self-reflecting on it um but also i do think um uh that's one of the reasons why, hearkening back to our discussion about power, why I'd be reluctant to write, I wouldn't write, I would never write a story about a professor. I wouldn't personally find that interesting, and uh, I wouldn't write a story about a writer. Um, I try to push myself, and also, uh, and this is important, my dad, uh, being a professor, would also characterize himself as a farm boy. Uh, he actually grew up as a Mennonite farm boy, so, um, the class thing isn't quite, uh, the class thing's more complicated than it might initially appear if you just said, uh, so I write a lot about farms, and I'm very interested in farms, and um, yeah. Could you, one last question. Last question. I want a book, uh, Alligator Junipers, and at the back cover it has short stories, and I guess maybe the, the first place might have been the short story they mistook their friendship for mayonnaise. Could each of you tell me what goes through your mind and hearts, including the MC? Uh, I might not be quoting it exactly, but that's what I remember. It, uh, Alligator Juniper's compilation, first prize winner was that. They mistook their friendship for mayonnaise, the prize winner for the shortest, best short story. So that's the short story in its entirety? Or yeah, that's, that's, yeah, like that's, there's about six just really short little stories. <laughs> They mistook their friendship for mayonnaise. That's the first one. No, that's just the short story. That's the short story in its entirety. They mistook their... Well, there's definitely a change in that story. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to sound like um, my uh, dearest critic of my book, who's uh, my mother-in-law. <laughs> and she said... Uh, she said, oh, I really like your book, but uh, I really want to see uh, what happens next in each story. I, I, so I want to see what happens next in, in the man is friendship. OK, thank you. Did you? Uh, I just have a lot, lot of visual questions, like, is the friendship between them on their skin? 
how are they touching? Or is it on the table? Is it like a sandwich mayonnaise situation? And one is very sad to me. Like if, if it's like a sandwich mayonnaise situation of a friendship, then like that's very separate from both of them. And so at least it's asking a lot of questions. It's important. <laughs> Thanks very much to our brilliant writers, and thank you all for listening.